Okay, we might get down to it. Next up, we have Javier Candera. Um, he's come all the way up from Melbourne, where he runs the Melbourne Python Users Group. Uh, at work, he often writes Python code to write his Python code for him. Uh, in his spare time, he likes to write Python code that writes and modifies other Python code. And today, he's presenting a talk called Mangle You a Python Interpreter for New Behavior. Give a round of applause to Javier. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here and not in the other talks, which I'm sure are equally interesting. So, Mangle You a Python Interpreter for New Behavior, you can see from the informal title. That is not a serious talk, which I want to say in case there's any prospective employees in the room, this is not the kind of stuff I do when code has to work. But, you know. So, I'm Javier, and I have a feeling like I'm here because Richard Jones couldn't make it. Because if you're a PyCon regular, you, would ha you might have noticed his absence this year, and I feel like I'm actually squatting in his slot where he does unspeakable things to the Python interpreter for the amusement of the audience. So, by the way, Richard this year is like those people who cook and don't get to eat because he was in the program committee, he did a lot of work, and then he doesn't get to enjoy the fruits of his labor. So please give him a hand of applause for Richard. <laughs> we miss you, Richard. You may have noticed that I've had you clap a second time with my photo on the screen that was deliberate. I'm priming the audience for success. So if this talk is about anything, it's about adding new syntax to Python, but not by the boring process which the Python core team do of actually hacking into Python and producing a new release. I would like to add syntax into Python by importing from modules, which is something that I'm sure the Q&A will be used to ask non-questions in which they tell me is wrong. And I agree, it's wrong, but wouldn't it be fun? So this has four parts. The first one it will be called Quiet None. The second will be called question dot, and then I will realize I've forgotten something and I'll have to go back to question dot and fail estrepitously at what I'm trying to do, and then I'll answer the question that no doubt is already in all of your minds. So, quite none. I have to thank um, Nick Coughlin for the name. What's the idea of quite none? So, last year, um, Nick did a, one of these State of the Python Interpreter talks in which he spoke of the um, elegant and ugly hacks in CPython. And at the end, someone asked, I remember that there was a, an audience question, and said, yes, but what would be interesting in order to compare, to get a bias, baseline, is the kind of ugly hacks that didn't get into Python. And Nick said he couldn't remember of any, but La Larry Hastings, who was here um, as a speaker, but was in the audience, said, I can think of one, it's PEP336, make none callable, which is arguably the worst PEP ever. This is my words, but um, I think the words of Larry Hastings were a very, very bad idea. And I want to make clear, Larry isn't here, I'm not making fun of him, but I think it's testament not to, us, not to his temperament, but to the kind of crap that you know, core developers and particularly release managers are subjected to, that when I said, oh no, but it would be cool to do it, he was like, no, no, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't. So, callable none, sorry, was something that shouldn't be done, like, with an agitated, oh no, you know, don't make that Rubik cube, it will open the gates of hell. And definitely can't be done anyway. Well, that's what Nick said, his first answer. It can't be done. There is a problem with that. And you know, um, that's a joke, and it's a kind of a racial joke, but I can tell you because I'm Spanish, it's how do you get 30 Spaniards inside a mini? And the answer is you tell them they won't fit. So if, they, if someone thought, you know, that telling me it shouldn't be done and it couldn't be done would make me not do it, they were missing the mark. Because of course, the week I came back, there was, you know, the Melbourne Python Users Group meeting in which we talk about what we've seen during PyCon. And normally we don't present new material, but I couldn't help myself. And I presented this little project, for which I think I have a demo. 
By the way, I'm going so fast compared to how fast I thought I would go that uh, there may be a lot of time for questions. So this is a question, though. This is quite none. Oh, sorry. I have to do it this way. Can you see? I hope you can see well. I've made, you know, everything very big. It's running in Python 3, so that way it's, it's, it's um, you know, forward thinking. And what else does it do? So it imports quite none as a module. That is good. By the way, the name was suggested to me by Nick, the idea being that, well, uh, I was thinking of crazy names for it, and he said, actually, what you're trying to do, because I thought it's like a monad. Not knowing what a monad is is amazing, because it can say anything is like a monad. If you're a mathematician or a, an actual computer scientist, you have to be careful about what you say, right? It's like being a doctor. And, um, and they, can't, they can't just say, oh, you have eczema. No, they have to actually look at you. So um, Nick mentioned, yeah, you know how you have not a number, which is nan, and you can have signaling nan that throws an exception, or quiet nan that just accepts any operation and returns nan. And that's the two different philosoph philosophies, and one would allow your numbers to go through the chain to produce um, a nan at the end. And then this, uh, what you want to do is a quiet none instead of a, co of, a, of a signaling none. Python has a signaling none. You try to do an illegal operation to none, and it throws an exception. <coughs> but you want a quiet none that will accept illegal operations and swallow them and return none. And by the way, you saw the quiet none already. I tried to get a quiet nan. And I looked up, you know, like gagged grandmothers, and there were so many code of conduct violations. I don't think I had, <laughs> I had to bleach the history of my browser clean. So there will be no photographs, and you will thank me for it at the end. So quite none is a context decorator, because you wouldn't want to do that to none and change the behavior of such an important singleton object. So we were talking about uh, patterns before. None is only one of none, and that's none. And we get this. And then inside here, we can print the call of none. And the result is none. So it appeared it works. And what else can we do? Oh, we can also do that to functions. We decorate a function that will take a callable. And in this case, just for show, it will print, calling the callable. So of course, int is a callable that returns 0 right, when you give it nothing, and then f of none returns none. So the gates of hell didn't open. So I was right at least about at least one thing. So yeah, I feel so smug about it. What am I doing? Yes, here we are. I should go back. No, how, how do I go back to show this? which is, if I'm correct, wait, this is complicated because I'm in, on two screens at the same time. By the way, isn't reveal.js completely awesome? Yeah. So I can't really see what I'm doing, but this, is, this explains what it does and how and why, right? So uh, blah, blah. It uses C types to open the non-type object, and it puts a call method inside it. And that call method can be written in Python. That's the beauty of C types. It uses the sys get frame trick, which um, Ryan Kelly isn't here. So he he presented it in in Python in Python Sydney in 2011 to to do um, clever tricks like uh, I think he was he was building something like Ruby blocks or stuff like that with it, and then you wrap the, the quiet non activation in a context manager. So it can be activated or deactivated, and you can just turn it on and off. And it works. And the reason why, there's a reason why. You know, there's a saying that those who don't have reasons is because they can't think up excuses. So the reason is that if you do a lot of um, data processing, you know, workflow pipelines, and you keep doing, you, you get data that you didn't create yourself. So that data is dirty. And it's often easier to make, um, it's called like a witness, like a token. No, a token, pass a token that's a none. And, and have if blah is none, then return none. If blah is a none, then else blah, 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 do something to it. 
So with this, you don't have to write those guards. The guards come with you as long as you are in the quiet nine context. And uh, yeah, of course, and because I was told I couldn't, so hey. So how do I do this? I'm back. So far, so good. So, so far, so good. I wrote this and I thought this would actually be like a nice lightning talk next year, right? It's like, ha ha ha, it's comic, I can do it in five minutes. I've taken it because I've made it longer. But I have a friend, his name is Ros Benchina, he's a very good programmer. He only uses Python when he has to. He's like a C++, writes musical algorithms and sound algorithms and real-time jitter correction algorithms. And um, he's an artist, he's a musician. He, we are together in a list of languages for arts. And there's a lot of um, functional programming advocates and functional programming fans and practitioners and, you know, we, for, for better words, like tragics of functional programming. And, and Ross, who uses C++, is, um, you know, very serious about his graph. He says, you know, I've seen this talk. And it's called Deconstructing Functional Programming. It's by Gilad Braha, who I don't know if you know him. He's, uh, you know, he works for Google. He's a serious uh, person with one foot in research, the other one in, in actual language design. He was one of the people who added generics to Java. And he's a serious person. He has this talk. It's an amazing troll. Troll has come to, to mean, in know, days, like an abusive person. But troll used to be someone who said something they didn't quite believe in order to get a reaction. And that was it. And, it was, and he trolls the functional programming community by saying, really functional programming? Everything is already invented, and everything is already in, in uh, object-oriented programming, and it's a really good talk. But on top of that, he, he's designing his own language called Newspeak, which will, uh, the fans of minim minimalism, and I know Python has many, and Newspeak is like the language in Orwell's 84. There was a language that, as it evolved, it, it lost words, it became smaller and smaller. So the idea of this, it's a language, it's inspired on self and on small talk, it's a minimalist language that in the design is to be refined by making it smaller. So, a simple expression, what could possibly go wrong? And we know what could go wrong because I just spoke about it, is that E could be null. So you have this ternary expression, right, that we can recognize from C and Java, etc. cetera. In, in, uh, in Python, it would be, uh, the expression would be none, if E is none, else, EVC. Cool. But then what happens if the nest in the chain is the same, right? So you would have to say none if E is none, else B if B is none. Sorry, none if E is none, else none if B is none, else EVC. So I've written it down because it's difficult to pronounce. And so far, so good. I don't think this is. And people always say, I mean, this is where you don't need quite none. And my answer is, I don't really need it. There's so many things we don't need, but we wouldn't have fun if we didn't think, if we only did things we need to do. So, the safe navigation operation is, I've called it question dot. He calls it safe navigation. I call it safe attribute access. It acts as an attribute only if it exists. If it doesn't, meh. And what do I know? What am I doing wrong? Oh, it's here. There is such a thing. So I've, I've done something wrong with the order of my. So of course, I'm going to do the demo before, which is here. I want to show it to you. I'm actually quite proud. So what did I do? I did it in PyPy, and I ran it out of the Python interpreter. So this is a Python interpreter running on my system Python, which is, uh, which is Python.2.7. So, boing, and it has to compile things because, you know, ding, ding, ding. So what do I do now? I say, yeah, 
So a string has a len method, right? That's how we get the length of strings. It looks up the method len. But the same string won't have a bar method. It gives me an attribute error, as it should. But since this, is a, this poor Python interpreter is one that I wrote myself, and not one that came from a box, I can do that. And it works. And now I feel like, yeah, I can write. You know that, how they said there is, there's this joke that you can write Fortran in any language? And the, there was this, this great linguist, um, Jacobson. He's one of the classic linguists of the early 20th century with Saussure and all of that. He was Russian. And he could speak seven languages, all of them Russian. That was how uh, thick his accent was. <laughs> so yeah, you can, you can write any language in Python now. So what do we do? Of course. We can also try to access something out of none. But it only works for getting. It doesn't work for setting, because you don't want to set safely. You just set, right? So we have a class. That's empty. And we make an instance. That's empty. Of course, we can set any attribute. We can't optionally set an attribute. That would be daft, right? Now, as opposed to all the other things that I've been doing so far <laughs> that are and that. <laughs> so, how well, is this going well? Now the fun thing is when I show that I've already written a pep and sent it to the mailing list to the call. <laughs> that's when? That's when there'll be gnashing of teeth. So, this is, oh, by the way, the right way to do this is PEP463, which has been rejected too. I'm not going to say it's been rejected and it shouldn't. It's been rejected full stop. And the idea of PEP063, this would be the Pythonic way to do it. Apparently not Pythonic enough because um, we don't rejected it. Is this the PEP? I can't really see since I have my notes. Uh, the idea is to have. exception expression, right? Instead of writing the expression in the long form, you write them as expressions. And it was rejected for many reasons. One is that the colon introduces a block, and the only place where it doesn't is the lambda, and the lambda is already something that we don't like very much, lambdas. This is Python. We don't do lambdas here. But, um, but I want to show that, you know, people have ideas, and it's okay to have ideas. So. Excuse me, because I think my problem is that my, my uh, presenter's notes have synchronized themselves with the. So I'm going to do this and resynchronize them. Cool. So I've already done the demo, I've already done this. So what is a man to do? You know? Sometimes peps get shut down, and now some of you who are actually paying attention must be realizing that I've lied to you, because I said, you know, you can change syntax the boring way that core developers do just by forking the interpreter. And you know what? That's exactly what I had done. Right? Where is it? Can you tell me if you see anything? Yes, I can't really see from here. Wait. Uh, the bucket. And one of them should be quite none. And the other one is complicated, not having. And the second one is, um, or is it the first one? Should I go to the first? Question dot is this? I can't read from this angle. Thank you. Here we are. And right, I didn't do source encoding, but this is where it says, this is this, and this is what explains what was done. So in truth, I didn't do what I said I would do, which is have syntax change in, a, in an interpreter by loading modules. I lied to you. So what I did is do it the old boring way that code developers do it. I put in the new operator syntax inside the grammar of the language, and then I implemented it by uh, make well, first I made the parser emit a new token 
and a new AST node for, I think I call it safe attribute access. Instead of attribute, it's called safe attribute. And then what I did is I tried AST mangling, but in the end I like better to just output existing bytecode. So the interesting thing is I've changed the compiler, the compiler that takes source code and produces PyC uh, bytecode, but I haven't changed the PyPy interpreter that interprets it, or the compiler that, they call it a translator, that takes the whole interpreter, Python interpreter written, written in Python and makes a JIT out of it. So it was an interesting thing to do, but I didn't say what I said I would. I have lied to you, and I've fallen short of my promise. And there's two things one can do in these circumstances, which are, one is to atone, and the other one is to say, ah, sorry. Well, there's a middle way, which is, if this was, you know, the challenge to use it for a regular 2.7 interpreter by loading modules, the challenge is act and try again. And I'm, you know, satisfied to tell you that I completely failed. <laughs> and um, I can show you that I failed in an interesting way, but I don't care so much because really this wasn't mission critical. We weren't going to run, you know, Soyuz, um, or what is it, Proton rockets to, to send to the space station in this. So what I do have is a partial demo that should be somewhere in this collection, here it is, of what the idea is, the concept. So lots of output that I can't read from here. This is, uh, Reveal.js is amazing, and I have uh, notes, but I would have to switch from one to the other. Here it is. So the idea is very simple. I would, my plan was, I knew I could mangle the AST, right? So every time I saw in my AST, I, I call it get attribute of node, damn it, the first time. See, before I call it uh, safe attribute, how I call it get attra or none, damn it. I think it's called safe get attra now. So the idea is to use one of the things that, you know, Python gives us and put it in the AST. And then, since I already had a PyPy interpreter that could pass, pass the Python 2.7 code using a source codec. So this is something that didn't work. I'm gonna tell you by, I can rewrite the code, and the code gets rewritten well, but the idea would be, you know what source codecs are? Have you heard of encodings? The idea is that you can have, as uh, Nick showed in his talk yesterday, you can have lots of different encodings for text in Python, but uh, Python only accepts ASCII, and uh, Python 3 only accepts Unicode, and if you put other things, what you can do is have a line, like a, like a hint, that says, hey, this page is in a different encoding. So if you register a codec, it will mangle the text and just change the encoding of the text. But of course, once you're in that process and you have text of a program, you can man in the middle it and you can essentially compile it into an earlier version, which is things that JavaScript people do all the time, right? The, the JavaScript people, why are we having problem with uptake of Python 3 who, that was released, I don't know, six years ago? I have two kids that are younger than Python 3. In the JavaScript world, no, this is crazy. In the JavaScript world, they're already using, they've been using for two years language features of a language that hasn't been released yet. So think of that. So the idea would be to do that. But for different reasons, I lost interest and I didn't do it. But I'm happy to report my failure because I do think, and this is, um, this is part of the hypocrisy of I'm here in the talk so I can, I can warp the narrative to anything I want. But it is true, when you're doing this for fun, it's not a tragic thing if you, okay, so I tried and I couldn't do it. You, can't, you, you can only do it with things you import or you exec because you have to register your codec first. So it would have been a complicated thing you can't run um, arbitrary programs, really, and uh, I, as I say, I lost interest. Oh, shiny, something happened. <coughs> you know, with respect to people who actually have attention problems, you know the joke is how do you get um, 
an attention deficit programmer, how many attention deficit programmers it takes to change a light bulb. Let's ride bikes! So, so yeah, I decided not to do it. So now you may be asking yourselves, and you're polite enough not to be jumping on me asking me, why? And the photo should give you a hint, because it's there. This is a great way to learn things, and one of the problems that you have with hacking into important projects, right, like C Python and PyPy, is that you go to the, you, people are busy, they're not gonna give you much of their time, and you go to the, to the bug tracker, and the bugs are really like, woo, I can't do that. But you can, and of course, if you do them, if you decide to tackle them, you have to do them right. Well, this, you do a half assed job of it, and nobody cares, except yourself as far as you do. So, for instance, I made none callable. I wanted to make attribute access and also item access, like a dictionary. But then, you know, I have kids. Uh, we, we went to another country for a couple of months to have the kids learn the language, which is, I'm Spanish, so they learn Spanish. So I didn't have the time. I didn't care. Well, if suddenly you're doing this, oh, I have a bug that I've, that I've accepted from CPython and PyPy. So, when you set yourself a small enough project, things are much easier. And um, in the, you know, we've had a lot of um, talk about yak shaving. So the thing is, you don't have to shave the whole yak. You just have to shave, you know, your initials into the side of the yak, <laughs> and uh, being careful not to stab the yak during you do it, and the yak has to compile when you finish, and you know, not seg fault when you run yak programs. It's, it's really good, it's really good. And uh, I say it really, like, um, I normally take things to, to, like, I take them too seriously. So this is important, sometimes not to take them seriously. So I'm going to say, you know, that one of the most racist things that you can say is, um, I'm not racist, but. Now that means I am racist. But uh, so I'm worried about saying this, because now I'm going to have the first question, like, why do you hate Python? No, I don't, but I love Python, but. You know, I do wish it were better in particular ways. You know, we all wish Python were better. We make diversity programs because we wish the community were better. You know, like the core developers add things to Python because they wish it were better, etc. And um, I particularly wish it were forward compatible. I particularly wish you could just load not crazy stuff, right? But I wish you could say, uh, import yield from in 2.7 and just have it, something that just appeared or is about to appear in, in 3.4 or 3.5. I just wish it were forward compatible. So I wish you could just import the syntax. And uh, I wish you could just roast dead peps. So some of them are stupid or bad, bad ideas. I'm sorry for insulting. Some of them are really bad ideas, but some of them aren't. I wish I could just say, you could just say, oh, here's this pep that I, that I proposed, and I'm not putting it in the core fork. No, no, I want you to try it and tell me, you know, how we can tweak it and not work in the mind experiment. It would be a democratizing experiment for Python, because right now when I see the discussions on the list, it's obviously people who know more than I do, but also they're talking from the, the head experiment of not having used the code. So, and to me, also it's clear that I have some kind of Lisp JavaScript envy Right? Because everybody knows that the Lisps allow you, they have like reader macros and allow you to change the syntax. Um, not necessarily, they have very little syntax, but they allow you to change control structures and add whatever you want. And JavaScript particularly, because JavaScript is and are plucky. And you know, something that I dislike is when someone says I, and talks, talks uh, bad about other languages and, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know those languages well enough, but what I do about, know about JavaScript is that JavaScript people were like in the desert with a language that wasn't very good, right? Like in the desert, there's only sand, and they looked in the sand and they said, we have work enclosures. We have functions that we can pass around at first class values that have inside state. And they used that to build any, everything they didn't have. They didn't have a module system, so they built one. They built four out of work enclosures. They, they said, oh, we need better APIs for accessing the DOM and the browsers aren't giving us. Oh, no worries, we'll do jQuery. 
because we have working closures. Whatever you want, the solution is working closures. It's like, um, and they load syntax as a module all the time. It's also a determination of the community to never be backwards incompatible because they can't afford to. So maybe Python made a miscalculation to how much Python could afford to break backwards compatibility. What is clear is that the JavaScript people knew perfectly well they couldn't. It's the most distributed language in the planet, and people are still running, you know, i5 and i6 in, in intranets. So, yeah, this is what I'd like to do. Pip install yield from, and then I run Python 2, and bling, my interpreter comes up, and I import yield from, I'm sorry, I, do, uh, I didn't mean to do that. And, and I just get on with my life, and I just added this. And this new library that someone wrote works. Right? It's like from future on steroids, because it doesn't have to come in the interpreter. It comes from pip. And I know I'm not going to get it, Nick, by the way. I'm not asking you to build it for me today, because you're taking a plane at the end of the day. But, you know, a man can dream. Or <laughs> I'd like to install this pip. I think I got the number wrong, but never mind. Imagine that I got the right, the right uh, pip. And then I run Python 2, and I import it. See, I got the, wrong, the number wrong. And then I say, boom, and I use a generator expression, and nothing explodes, because the module just loaded the generator. I would like to do that. And in fact, I have a plan to try and do it, which is what I want to talk about next. So I love Python. I'm not going to say but, because really, I am not X, but it's the kind of worst thing. So I'm going to say I love Python, and I also want it to be, to be better, like all of us do. And going forward, what could I do? It's not what I'm going to do. Could I add get adder and get item to quiet none? I think I could. And if I did it, it wouldn't be, I mean, kind of the, the proof of concept is done, and I've kind of taken it off my chest just to learn better how the interpreter works, because that was one of the goals. Fix the stack problem in PyPy question dot. I didn't show you, but I'm leaving one value on the stack. So when I put underscore, I always get one value behind the value that I just generated. And I think I can fix it, but I didn't want to touch it before the talk, you know. Get the, the hack that loads a source encoding codec as SDL working. Maybe I could do it. It would be good for future Python, it said here. No? So, if you, Ed, um, from, from, I've just blanked the surname. Someone help me. Huh? Thank you. Ed Schofield from, thank you. Sorry, Ed. I've, um, I'm at the end of my, of a very long day. So, you could have, you could have said hi. So, Ed has done, Ed Schofield has done um, Future Python, which is a way to be able to use Python 3 syntax in Python 2. So this would help if maybe we could get this source codec as, a, as an SDL hack working. I think, by the way, it's an important project. I, you can see from this talk, I support it. I would like to learn how to add new bytecodes to, to PyPy. So I did something that only touched the source code to PyC interpreter. I would like to do that. And by the way, if any of you are PyPy people, I'm going to stay here for the sprints. I would love to be able to get deeper into it. But what I'd really like to do is intercept the creation of exception objects and manage to run arbitrary Python code at the creation of exceptions, which is, you know, by the way, what I'm going to say now sounds like a boast, but it isn't. I didn't really spend much time doing what you've seen. I spent mostly like a week of evenings on each one of the two projects and then, you know, lost interest, plus all the time that you spend like writing the readme and doing presentations for MPAC and also in Madrid where I'm, where I'm from and meeting the community there so and thinking about it a lot. But what I really, really, really spent a lot of time and gone absolutely nowhere is trying to intercept the creation of exceptions. Because if any of you um, is the same kind of programming language tragic as I am, they will know that what I'm trying to do is add to Python something called restartable exceptions, aka conditions. So exceptions in Python rewind the stack, and you lose the state that was down there. And conditions 
in, like in Dylan and restartable exceptions, what they do is if you can run code inside the exception and see what the state is that caused the exception, maybe you can say there's no exception. And I would like to do that as a module for Python, adding some of these, um, you know, C types hack that intercept the creation of exceptions. And I would like, seriously, I would like if someone said, as, look, my promise is that I will never try to make a pep and actually submit it. It is a cry for help, more than one kind. Acknowledgements, yes, I want to thank, of course, Nick for his patience with me because I, I kept like sending email. And Richard Jones, because he gave a talk last year called Don't Do This, which is exactly what I did in order to do Quiet None. So Ryan F. Kelly um, was the one who, who said, while, while Nick was saying still, oh, I don't know that it can be done. He said, oh, maybe it can. Why don't you look at my, at my talk on how to do uh, exceptions? And Graham, I, I've been talking to Graham for a year about this, and he's always been a good friend and given me good advice and encouragement, which I need sometimes. And uh, the Melbourne and Python community, it's great. Seriously, you don't need, if I have an advice, a piece of advice is you don't need to have something finished to bring it to your own community that you see every month. Bring them something half done, and they maybe have advice or criticism or questions, and all three are good. This talk is available. It doesn't have much value without me talking on top of it, but it has the URLs for the project, so you don't have to write down. This is my email if you want to tell me anything, and this is my Twitter. And I appreciate you being here instead of on the other talks where. We have five minutes. Yeah, for questions. we have five minutes for questions. Yep. Everything you want to be, everything you want to do, you can. It can already be done. It's called Macro Pi. Check it out now. Uh, I've seen Macro Pi and I love it, but you can't load arbitrary syntax. Yeah, you can. You can uh, at runtime you import the module, and you can. Apparently, that's what I'm reading from the. Um, um, I've I've used MacroPy a tiny bit, and it is my impression that, for instance, you couldn't do the question dot, and you couldn't do the callable none. Okay. I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but. Sorry. Hi Lang is a. Lisp interpreter that runs on the C Python VM, so maybe. Right, it's a kind of closure. It's it seem of it, it's it, yeah inspired by closure. Maybe it's something that I could try. But um, do I have any takers? No. Any more questions? Um, we have a little bit of time left. Is there anything else you yeah, want to Yeah. Any cover? questions about anything really? Yeah. Like. Where Ask him from? how he does his hair. Like, um, uh, this is more a question for my uh, uh, to help my son out rather than myself because one of the things that uh, uh, I actually noticed. Uh, I know Nick and I um, have met you through this, and uh, I think it's fantastic that you guys are, are like uh, hacking around with uh, language and and so forth and. Uh, um, my son loves to do exactly the same thing, and Nick's given me some good pointers as well in where to uh, point it. Xavier. Um, what would you suggest for someone, you know, uh, young who is into playing around with language and... and I'm, I'm in this situation myself because I have kids who are maybe a bit younger, and what I hear is that, do you like Minecraft? Sorry, what's your name? You like Minecraft? Yes? So. Um, Carrie Ann Philbin, who may still be here, talked about how people are using languages to make things in Minecraft. So instead of doing them by hand, you know, by clicking, you write a program that builds stuff for you. So maybe that would be a thing that's already an interest that you have, and you could do it with programs. And you know, you can, you can be bad at the beginning. That's, this is kind of the main lesson of this, of this talk. You can be kind of crappy at what you do. It's okay at the beginning. That's how you learn. No one else? No. Um, actually, how, how do you actually manage to create the, how do you actually manage to change the syntax there? So the syntax of a language is, is defined, I did it in two different ways. So that's a very good question. And I haven't explained it, and it's important. So you can do it in two ways. 
And the two ways I did it was, the first one was I hooked into the bit of the language that responds to the syntax that already exists. So I made none callable because you can, al so you can already make things callable in Python. Just none is not enabled. So I just had to go and kind of flip the ship, the, the, the switch, so none could be callable as well. So sometimes all you have to do is find something that already exists but t happens not to be enabled. It's like, you know, when you make a new room for your house just by throwing down a wall because a, a room was already there. In the second case, this, this, uh, this kind of um, tower of things that you build on top of others, and the first thing for building a language is you write a as, as syntax, the grammar of the language in a file. So I just went in and wrote um, one more line that said, um, as well as having attribute access, I want to have safe attribute access. And then the thing broke, so I went fixing everything that broke all through the line. So with the new grammar, it didn't understand the new syntax that I had created, so I went and added the thing that is read from the syntax. And then I added the generation of the behavior. So you, you basically touch a bit, and then when it breaks, you fix the bit that breaks, and then when it breaks, you fix the bit that breaks. <laughs> Not very smart, and I shouldn't be saying this in video, but yeah, that's what I do. That's how I work every day. That and Stack Overflow. It was my camera. Hi, Ami. And on these words, I think, oh, sorry. Thanks, Javier. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, so do, do you have any references on, um, on the stack frame manipulation tricks and the uh, AST? So um, the stack tricks? frame manipulation trick is, uh, is uh, Brian Kelly's talk from 2011 in, in Sydney. And I've actually, it's, it's not complicated to the point where the snippet of code in quiet none is all you need to know, because it's, it's, it's really that simple. And uh, you want also the, the source codec trick? Um, yeah, yeah, the that source, and AST as well. The we source wrote. codec trick. So for AST, what I did was I just started using uh, Python comes. Every, every Python interpreter comes with its own AST manipulation library. And I found one by Armin Ronacha, I think, Mitsuhiko. And I just used it. And you know, you read the source code and you figure out what it's doing. But for, this, for the codec, there's this guy called Delphic. I don't know his real name. Delphic is his name on, on GitHub. That he came actually to, to MPAG and presented this SDL that he stands for testing called Nose of Yeti that uses this trick to create an RSpec type um, SDL for Python. So that's where I, reading his source code is where, I, I actually Google, because that's what you do, you do. Um, source codec tutorial, uh, nothing. So I just looked at his source code, and it's, it's not very clear, because he uses it via plugins. So you have like two levels of indirection to get at the point. But you basically make an object that has readers and writers, and that readers and writers point to function that transform your code, and they can transform it arbitrarily, and then register that with uh, the codec.register uh, API. So it's. The documentation, the Python documentation is kind of very sparse. It just tells you the API, but doesn't tell you how to go about doing it. Thanks. Um, and just, if folks want to play with this kind of thing, we've actually made it simpler in the import system. Uh, so for Python 2, you have to pip install import lib2, um, which is a backport of the Python 3 import system. Uh, and what it has is it has a hook in it that basically just hooks that source code to bytecode translation step. So you can, you can do a lot of this stuff with a custom importer now rather than having to uh, sure. mess around with the codex. The, the idea that I never got to do is arbitrarily being able to transform the first file that you load, your main, like one script, one one file script, and have that have the syntax. That would be kind of the goal that I failed at so strepitously. So is that we it? might finish up now because this is about to come a hallway. Um, Javier, there's your Thank you very much. PyCon mug. Thank you for the amazing talk. And he'll Thank be around, you. I'm sure, for yes, if anyone I'll be for has the sprints. So I'd love to talk to each of you individually. All right, let's give him another round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>